Dear Marrowlings, Welcome to this video where we are talking about psychiatry questions which had come up in the NEET 2022. Now, let's try to understand what these questions are trying to teach us. Patient came with a history of overdose presented with severe respiratory depression and drug of choice for reversal of respiratory depression is. Now, what overdose are they talking about? They are talking about overdose of opioid and the, the patient is already in severe respiratory depression. So what is the treatment? It has to be IV naloxone. IV naloxone. The signs of opioid overdose commonly are three important signs. Stupor, constricted pupil and respiratory depression. Stupor, constricted pupil and respiratory depression gives you a clue that most probably the patient is in opioid overdose. And many times you know the patient is unconscious and is not going to tell you what overdose he has done, right? So when you look at the pupil, you might get an idea that it could be opioid overdose. You might see IV marks and those things and you might also get a history of he being abusing opioid for some time. So that should give you an idea of opioid overdose. So please remember IV or a nasal spray of naloxone is available for emergency use. Can you use naltrexone anywhere? Please understand naltrexone is also used in opioid addiction management to reduce craving and it is available as an oral form and an injectable depo form not as an emergency drug. So naltrexone can always be used in opioid management on long term basis to reduce craving but for emergency rooms what do you use? You typically use the naloxone which is available as IV or a nasal spray for you to kind of give to these patients and it is life-saving and good to have access to this medication if you're suspecting opioid overdose. Moving to the next question, a 16-year-old girl comes with intense craving for food. She eats large amounts of food which is followed by recurrent vomiting. What is the probable diagnosis is the question. So the key words here is a 16-year-old person, intense craving and eating large amounts. So binge eating and recurrent vomiting. And most probably you are believing that it's a kind of a voluntary induced vomiting which could be happening. So what do you think is the answer? Let's look at some of the choices. When you're talking about anorexia, anorexia can be having anorexia patients can be having typically restriction of food intake rather than intense craving and most importantly they have a fear of weight gain and they have distorted body image right they have a very distorted self body image now there are two types of anorexia nervosa if you see restrictive type and the binge purge type now binge purge will happen also in bulimia nervosa right so how do you differentiate it first of all you need to look at bmi when you look at the bmi the BMI should be less than 17.5 in DSM or 18.5 as per ICD. If the BMI is low and if they mentioned about BMI, then only you think of anorexia nervosa. Otherwise, you cannot diagnose anorexia nervosa because BMI criteria is an important criteria to diagnose anorexia nervosa. With this understanding, let's talk about the other choices. What happens in atypical depression? Forget about eating less. They have hypersomnia, hyperphagia. They actually have interpersonal sensitivity, Leiden paralysis and those. These are typical features of atypical depression. So we are not talking about atypical depression here. Are we talking about binge eating disorder here? Binge eating can be seen in binge eating disorder, but typically purging is not seen. But in the question, they have mentioned about recurrent vomiting. So what is the only answer you should think of? The only answer you should think of is bulimia nervosa, which will have binge and purge eating, binge and purge eating. So some students will say, sir, why not? It is the binge purge type of anorexia nervosa. Because there is no mention about BMI, I think we should go ahead with bulimia nervosa because the criteria is already satisfied. For you to say whether it is anorexia nervosa, you need one more criteria which is not given. So you cannot still diagnose. So best answer here would be bulimia nervosa. Understood? Let's move to the next question. A four-day postpartum uh, lady presented with tearfulness, mood swings and occasional insomnia. What is the likely, likely diagnosis? I'm sure you would have already guessed, right? Four days postpartum time tearfulness, mood swings, occasional insomnia. Not significant symptoms, but causing a little bit of distress the two, four days after postpartum. What are we talking about? We are talking about postpartum blues. So to understand postpartum period, you need to understand the postpartum period as per DSM is about four weeks, as per ICD is about six weeks. Clinically, we know it easily about six months to one year where we see the risk of all clinical conditions which can precipitate in the postpartum period. So even though 
DSM says only four weeks is the postpartum period and the ICD says six weeks. Clinically, we know the risk of depression and those quite remain in these patients at least for six months to a year postpartum. Understood? It is good to know when you're talking about obstetrics, we know of BPD, right? The same BPD is important for us to know in the postpartum time also. What is this BPD we are talking about? Not in obstetrics, but here, here we are talking about the blues, the psychosis and depression. This postpartum blues or the baby blues occurs in about 50% of the pregnancies. Postpartum blues, uh, the baby blues occurs in about 50% of the pregnancies and it is quite benign in nature. Psychosis happens only in about 0.1% of the pregnancies. That is one in thousand pregnancies you can see psychosis. But the problem with psychosis is it can be very severe, life-threatening. You might lose the patient or in terms of an extended suicide, sometimes the kid also might be killed in that process of psychosis. And psychosis mostly acutely presents. Within a few days, the psychotic uh, presentation would be quite severe and difficult to handle in postpartum psychosis many times. So when you're talking about depression, it is about 5 to 15 percent uh, of the pregnancies can lead to depression. So if you really look at postpartum blues is almost seen in 50 percent of the pregnant women, but luckily it is benign and it is self-limiting. Mostly it goes away. So you have to reassure them and kind of calm them down, teach them simple techniques to re maybe relax or calm themselves and they, will, they might be much, much better. But if it's psychosis, it's quite rare, but quite severe. Depression is quite common in about 5 to 15 percent, up to 10 percent. In some studies, they say, in some studies, they say 5 to 15 percent of the pregnant women who deliver might go through depression. So if you look at the delivery at a particular time, what you need to understand is the postpartum blues typically happen within the first week to two weeks, within the few days maximum within two weeks it comes and goes off that is what happens in postpartum blues but when you're talking about psychosis most of the times it happens from the in, uh, in and around the second week in and around the second week whereas depression generally comes a little later depression generally comes a little later understood that is what happens in postpartum period so with this we come to end of this psychiatry uh, questions recall of the NEET 2022. Thank you very much. Best wishes for the preparation.